was a teenager, I thought I was supposed to have a motto. It was just one of those things an ambitious Presbyterian white boy from the Midwest was supposed to have, <laughs> like a favorite sport and a blue blazer. <laughs> and my motto was this, give all of yourself to something greater than yourself. Give all of yourself to something greater than yourself. It's cheesy. It is. But it still kind of stirs me, at least a little bit. And I think it spoke so deeply to my adolescent self because it promised a kind of happy resolution of morality and ambition. I mean, it, it, it sounds kind of moral, at least, doesn't it? Right? Give all of yourself to something greater than yourself. It sounds like a service ethos. There's self-giving here. It's not, it's not selfish. It's not grasping after mine, mine, mine. It sounds moral. It promises goodness, and it promises more. For if you give all of yourself to something that's really greater than yourself, that thing will give things back to you, right? honors, and even more if it's really greater than yourself and you really pour yourself into it, then it will live on even after you pass away and you will live on in it forever. But what happens when you give all of yourself to something that is greater than yourself and it doesn't live forever? What happens when you give all of yourself to something greater than yourself? And it dies. These kind of thoughts have been much on my mind lately. They came with special force maybe a year and a half ago when I heard the news that the First Presbyterian Church of Dundee, New York was being closed and sold and turned into the Winner's Circle Event Center. The Winner's Circle. I could not make that up. But it, it, it makes sense in Dundee. The, the winner's circle, is a, it's a deli, it's a restaurant, and they are, by all accounts, really good. And they've got a thriving catering business. They will provide the food for weddings and funerals and civic events kind of throughout the region. And I, I, I didn't see the business plan, but I'm guessing it's something like this. Hey, we're not going to just provide the food for the wedding. We're going to do the wedding. And if we're going to do the wedding, then we need an event center. And here's this kind of awkward, hard-to-sell building going cheap down the street. And so they bought themselves a beautiful brick Romanesque building. A building where, for more than a century, the bread had been broken and the cup had been shared. The water had been poured out in celebration of the covenant where people had made vows for their whole lives, where people had cried tears at the loss of the one they made those vows with, a place where prayers had been prayed and hands had been laid. It's an amazing building. That There are certain times on certain days during the year when the light comes through this window and the whole room is bathed in golden light. I've caught glimpses of the New Jerusalem in that room. No kidding. And I've poured out my whole self all over the floor of that room. It's messy. But I'm not alone. And now that place is the dining hall for a deli. And you know, really, the building is the least of it. The building is the least of it. What really nags at me are the people. Many of them have died, and the rest of us are scattered. Scattered like sheep without a shepherd. What does it mean to give all of yourself to something greater than yourself that then doesn't even last as long as you do? You know, it's not just that congregation. We Presbyterians have been losing members for more years than I have been alive, and I am not young. And it's not just Presbyterians, it's Episcopalians and Congregationalists and Methodists and Lutherans and Reformed folk. 
It's Quakers. It's not just the people that are often called that old main line. No, no, no. It's Church of Christ. It's Southern Baptist. It's the Crystal Cathedral. It's countless Catholic parishes across the country and more. To be a church person today is to be wrestling with this question of what does it mean to give all of yourself to something greater than yourself and watch it pass away? And if you are sure that that is a question that you might come to me with about, you know, you might have a pastoral interest to me, you might come to me and say, there, there, but, but you don't think that's really a question for you, then I might ask you exactly why are you so sure? What's the source of your confidence? Where are you putting your trust? Which is just another way of saying, whom do you worship? Because the God Christians worship has this centuries-long habit of letting churches die. The God Christians worship lets nations fall, lets temples be destroyed. The God Christians worship lets the Messiah be crucified. So if you are sure that your church could never die, whom do you worship? And if your answer starts by telling me about your strategic plan or your charismatic pastor or your endowment, or maybe it's better than that because you're high-minded. It, it, it's better than that. It's about having a mission that is in sync with the times. If, if your answer sounds like that, then your church is already dead. It's already an event center. <laughs> and I hope you're in the winner's circle. Because <laughs> my old church is. So that, that question about what it means to give our lives for a church that dies, it's a question Christian folk cannot avoid. I don't think we could ever avoid it when we're in our right minds, but there have been times in history when it sure felt like we could avoid it, right? We didn't have to face it. But now is a time when we just have to face it. It's coming at us, coming at us fast. Now, one version of this talk could then break that down, give you some sociology, some history to help you understand that. That, that talk would have a, lot, a big deck of PowerPoint slides. Most of them would feature graphs of lines that are going down and to the right. <laughs> but you probably heard that talk. And I can't give that talk. I thought about it, but I can't. Because this is not a fundamentally a sociological question for me. It's a personal question. I mean, I, I'm a narcissist. I don't really care about the graphs. I want to know, what does it mean for me? I, I gave four years of my life to that church, and it's gone. What does that mean for the meaning of my life? And I'm enough of a not a narcissist to know that what I gave is nothing, nothing, compared to the people who gave deeply for decades to sustain that congregation. I, I think of people like Lynn and Reba, of Anna Lee and Edna, of Robin and Les, people I love. What does it mean for the meaning of their lives that this congregation they poured themselves out for? What, what does it mean that they saw it go away? It's a personal question. And when you let it sink to the level of the personal, you understand it's not just a church question. For there is no institution in this world. And not just institutions, but there is no cause, no movement, no mission in this world that will not in time pass away. There is nothing greater than us that we can give our lives to that will last forever. So let that question now sink not just to that broader level, but let it sink down to the deepest of the personal levels. Because it's really not about these causes and movements, no matter how righteous they are. It's not about them. It's mostly about people. And what does it mean that anyone that we can love can pass away? That anyone that we can pour our lives out in love that anyone we can love, not just can pass away, but will pass away. On some deep and dreadful level, I think, we know this from a pretty young age about our parents and our grandparents. 
but it is also true, please, God, no, it is true even of our spouses, our partners, our friends. And it is true of our children and our children's children. It is true of all those we love. So what does it mean to love people who will pass away? You know, that, this question comes to me as something of a revelation, the kind of thing that I think you should give a Theo Ed talk on, <laughs> is almost surely an index of my privilege. For it is a privilege to move through this world with the confident assumption that the things I build with my hands will live after me. No one will come along and destroy them or take them away for their own purposes. It's a privilege to get to think like that, and it is a privilege that the children of Israel did not enjoy. It's a privilege the disciples of Jesus did not enjoy. It is a privilege that the people of God have almost never enjoyed. And what does it mean to move through this world with the unspoken confidence that these two sons that Susan and I love so much that we pour ourselves out for all the time? What does it mean to live with that easy confidence that they will live lives that extend far beyond our own? We don't even say that. We are so sure of it. We know it so surely, but that is a privilege that has been systematically denied to black and brown people, to indigenous people, to people of Asian descent in this country for centuries. It was a privilege that was brutally denied to Mamie Till Mobley. Mamie Till Mobley, the, the mother of an African-American boy, Emmett Till, who was slaughtered by a white mob in Mississippi when he was 14 years old. So Mamie Till Mobley didn't have the luxury of, of, of wondering, the luxury of pretending that those she loved would live long past her. No, she had to face that terrible truth in her lifetime. And she asked that Emmett's body be displayed to all the world so that all the world would have to reckon with that fact. And friends, we have not even begun that work. We have not even begun that work. So what do we do with this? Emmett died when he was just 14. Does that mean that Mamie Till Mobley's love was all in vain? No. I mean, the question, the question isn't just wrong-headed, it's profane. So it deserves not just a negative answer, it deserves a negation at a deeper level. No, 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 it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that because that's not the way love works. The love of Mamie Till Mobley for Emmett was infinite. And the infinite quality of that love did not depend on an infinite duration of Emmett's life. The infinite quality of that love was realized in the moment of the love itself. Just so when we pour out our lives for a cause, when we give ourselves to a cause... The meaning and the dignity of that action does not depend on the cause lasting beyond our lifetimes. It does not even depend on that cause winning a moment in this age. It depends on the cause being aligned with the will and work of God in the world. Let me try to say this in a theological key. Try to speak God. Here's the way I'd speak God on this. When we love mortal things, when we love like Mamie Till Mobley loved, we love like God loves, for God loves mortal things too. That's the nature of the love of God, the incredible fact of God's love for creatures. When we, too, love creatures, we love like God. Say it's stronger now. We don't just love like God, we love with God. And in that loving with God, we are, by the grace of God, joined to God. And in that being joined to God, there is the very substance of life and life 
abundant. The value is eternal in an instant. Now, seeing the world like that changes the ways we think about the future. Now, it it does not breed indifference to the future. Understanding that, you're, you're, that the infinite value of a love for a person doesn't depend on that person living forever. It doesn't mean that we become indifferent to whether the person lives or dies. I mean, that's crazy talk, right? That's not what it means. Just so to say that, that the value and dignity and meaning of pouring our lives out for a cause does not depend on that cause succeeding for centuries doesn't mean we don't care whether we actually get the, a raise in the living wage this week or not. No, no, no. Those earthly things matter very much. It doesn't lead to a stoic indifference to the way things work out. But it does make us reckless. <laughs> reckless. And I mean reckless in the literal Oxford English Dictionary kind of sense of the word. Reckless. That is with it is reckless love is love without wreck, love without reckoning, love without calculating costs and benefits. Reckless love is love that can love a fellow being who will die. Reckless love is love that can pour itself for a cause that might not even last till tomorrow or might last and worst be co-opted and turned back to the cause that it was supposed to serve. Reckless love pours itself out like that. The love of God is reckless love. Indeed, I, I'd even go so far as to say that if it is love, it is reckless. And reckless love frees us up. It sets us free for a different kind of relationship to the church and to the other institutions that we give ourselves to. Because when we love recklessly, we're not trying to prolong the life of the church so that we can somehow extend our own lives through the life of that institution and attain some cheap facsimile of immortality. No, instead we can serve the church with different eyes, not trying to make it live forever, but working so that it will be worth lamenting when it passes away. And it doesn't just change our relationships to institutions, it changes our relationship to the people in our lives. For when we love with reckless love, we're not hoping that uh, we can project ourselves through our children, that we will perfect them as projects so that then their accomplishments carry us into something like immortality for the future. No, we can just love these kids as the beautiful, mixed bags of mortality <laughs> that they are, that we are. We can love spouses and partners and lovers with open hands. We can love neighbors, strangers, sojourners in the land. We can love people who don't deserve it. We can love people who will die. We can love people who will betray us. And when we love like that, we love like Jesus. We love with Jesus. And so we are joined to that loving body of Jesus, wounded and risen. Now, in case you think this is going to end with a TED talk, pep talk, yay, reckless love, go out, love recklessly. I should uh, warn you, reckless love is costly. It costs God everything, everything. And it will cost you too, probably already has. But in that costly, reckless love, there is life. Thanks.